And Nicole uh, Stott is joining us. She is going to talk about her space aboard the International Space Station in Space Shuttle, also an undersea habitat, the aqueous habitat. And she is very uh, multi-talented. She is an artist as well. Uh, and it encourages people to use art as a way to appreciate Spaceship Earth as our shared home and our need to behave like crewmates. She is a veteran NASA astronaut. Her experience includes two space flights and 104 days living and working in space. I will hand it off to Nicole to share uh, her exciting presentation, and I'm sure everyone will have lots of questions. Nicole, thank you for being with us. My pleasure um, to be here with you. Uh, this theme, Women Blazing Trails, or Women Blaze Trails, I love it. Um, I think that's what exploration is all about um, in general, right? Uh, and, and we're all doing it, I think, in one, in one way or another. We're all exploring in both familiar and unfamiliar places. And today, as Kate mentioned, I'll share a little bit about um, my time in space, but also about how that has come back to Earth for me as well. So let's see, we'll share screen and we'll go app. Like, I always have to talk myself through it, as Joe knows. <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, is it working for you guys to see the presentation? Yay, I think so. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I always uh, tend to start with this slide for any talk I give um, because I get asked a lot what it was like just to be in space, my memory of living and working in space. And this one picture kind of wraps it up and reminds me of it all and that it's really beautiful. And as you can imagine, um, you know, living and working in space um, through the window, it's quite gorgeous. Um, it also, I look at it and I see this little silhouette of the space shuttle Atlantis. And uh, while it looks like it's just hanging there, you know, still in space, I know that we're traveling at around 17,500 miles an hour or at about five miles a second, which means we lap the planet around every 90 minutes or so. And that means we get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets out the window every 45 minutes. Um, I also know I'm inside that little space shuttle with, um, with my crewmates. Uh, we're on our way home from my first flight, which was a little over three months on the station. And I know that my friend uh, and crewmate, Jeff Williams, is uh, on the space station and took this amazing photo for us. All right, next one, let's see. Okay, so this, you know, this picture here, um, when I think about exploration, to me, it's, it's about curiosity and discovery. And uh, I was very fortunate to have parents who shared what they loved with me. And for me to be able to um, be curious and discover from, you know, from the cockpit of my dad's airplane to uh, see Earth from a totally different perspective that way. And as we prepare to go to space to live and work there, we're doing that same kind of thing by going and exploring in other extreme environments. Um, for instance, it was mentioned that I had the opportunity to live underwater. I did that for 18 days on a mission uh, in the Aquarius habitat off the coast of Key Largo, um, sitting at about 60 feet uh, below the surface uh, in this Aquarius habitat about the size of a school bus, roughly the size of one of our space station modules. And Pretty much everything about that environment, with the exception that it's water surrounding you versus the vacuum of space, is as close as you can get to what it's gonna be like to live and work in space. And so it's this way of looking at our planet, I think in a whole new way, but also of learning to explore um, even places like space by, by going underwater. We kind of joke that we're, we get to go to live and work in inner space to learn how to live and work in outer space. And my time in space uh, was spent primarily on the International Space Station, which I hope you will agree is, um, is just this wonderful like masterpiece in space. 
Uh, if you laid it out on the ground, it's a little bit bigger than a football field. Uh, we live and work inside these modules that are, are pressurized, so we can float around in our you know, normal clothes. We don't have to wear a spacesuit all the time. But this, this space station, I could talk about it all day, is absolutely the best example of um, uh, living off the grid, <laughs> the best example of international partnership, of how we can live and work together as uh, peacefully and successfully as an international community, uh, and, and just a wonderful example of the kind of technology and challenges that we can overcome together when we decide that there's some greater good mission to do so. <clears throat> and I love showing this picture and, and reminding people that for over 20 years now, this spacecraft has been orbiting the planet every 90 minutes and with, with representatives from five international space programs representing 15 different countries together. Absolutely the best example of how we, we should be living and working as crew members here on Spaceship Earth. And, and just to follow on with the, the theme of converse, conservation, I'll, I'll tell you, the way we live on our mechanical space station, you know, this, this, the spacecraft that we've built to mimic what, as best we can, what Earth does for us naturally. Every day we're aware of how much CO2 is in our atmosphere, of how much clean drinking water we have, of the integrity of our thin metal hull and it's how it's continuing to protect us and the care of all of our, our crewmates that we share this place with. So again, I will say, I think just the best way to think about how we should be living and working together here on Spaceship Earth. Uh, my time in space was spent with these with these uh, folks, um, and I show this because I think as crewmates, we want to enjoy ourselves. We should enjoy uh, the experience we're having, the exploration that we're doing, the place that we're living, but we should also know that when things go wrong, that the people that we have around us will, will have our backs and that we'll work as much as humanly possible to solve the problems that we have together. And these absolutely were those people for me in space. And I think that the point um, of going to live and work in space in this microgravity environment on a space station is that, uh, that we can look at things differently, that we can take gravity out of the equation and we can be uh, learning more and more scientifically about things we thought we already knew a lot about, but we look at them in a different way everything about the science that we're doing and the way we work on that space station is ultimately about improving life here on earth, which I just loved. I mean, for me, that was the reason to go and do something like be an astronaut and fly in space. And we get to look at things differently from places like, um, you know, working on a spacewalk, um, putting ourselves in our own personal spaceship, going outside and climbing around the station that is our our home and 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 looking at again looking at things a little bit differently. Um, I'll just you know a little joke here. My my mom says that this picture is the one that reminds her why she was afraid while I was in space because um, you know in her mind there should always be a two hands on the space station rule. Um, and the absolute, um, I think the ultimate like perspective changing experience uh, was the opportunity to look out the windows um, of our space station, to experience our home, this planet below us in a whole new way. And when I think about it now, it was kind of like I was, I was exploring without even really knowing that I was exploring when I was looking out the window. I was learning new things for sure. I was being surprised every time um, by the view I would see. I was in awe of how just gorgeous um, this planet that we share as a home is. And I found that that, that view kind of evolved for me. Um, I'm in Florida right now. I grew up in Florida. I considered Florida my home. I wanted to see Florida from space. And so if I knew it was gonna be out the window, I flew to that window to, to try and see it, to try and capture it with a picture too. Um, I thought of Florida as my home. I wanted to, to see uh, the earth, you know, complemented by the space station, you know, in an artistic way, looking at these solar arrays that collect all that solar energy and generate all the power for us on the station. 
but experiencing that through the glow of one of those sunrises or sunsets uh, circling our planet out the window as well. Um, I had to get my brain wrapped around uh, things appearing different and appearing almost unbelievable to me. Um, you know, like for instance, this is my crewmate, Al, crawling along the bottom of the space station. That's the glow, the blue glow of Earth, you know, 250 miles below him. And just it, having our brains accept the fact that Al has no sense of up or down. Al feels like he's crawling along the floor. And so you don't have to worry about Al falling um, back to Earth from that position. The geography of, of our planet, getting to know Earth in kind of a more intimate way, um, being able to look at a picture or a view of Earth through the window and know, okay, that's the desert patterns of Africa, not Australia, or understanding which place uh, on Earth I was seeing without having to look at a, com a computer reference to do that. And then it just, I mean, it really evolved to me um, from that look at the familiar, um, wanting to see that, that uh, understanding of how things will appear to me, the geography of our planet, but just to kind of the awe of the next kind of beautiful part of the art of Earth that I was going to see. And this is a way zoomed in picture. It's a tiny little island, naturally shaped island in um, the Red Sea. And and I remember looking at this and thinking, wow, you know, God must have a wonderful sense of humor because these kinds of things are scattered all over our planet. And I think as humans, we're, we're curious, we're meant to discover them, we're meant to go explore and, and, and find them, understand them. Um, this is absolutely my favorite picture that I took from space. Again, way zoomed in. It's a tiny little chain on the Northern coast of South America called Las Rocas. And I remember looking out the window and thinking, man, it looks like somebody had reached down uh, with a big paintbrush and painted a wave on the ocean. And this one image has been a huge inspiration for me. It was while I was in space and it, and it is now in that um, I had the opportunity to paint with watercolors while I was on the space station. I think about these things like art in space, music in space, uh, sewing, writing poetry, even the photography that we do out the window. It's, it's really, it's like we're putting the human in human space flight. And I had the opportunity to paint. That, that image was my inspiration for the painting I did in space. It's been the inspiration for my own personal artwork that I've done since retiring from NASA. But it was um, very thankfully to me, um, the thing that allowed me to get introduced to some folks that are working with kids around the world doing all kinds of wonderful art projects. And we've, we've focused them on you know, space themed uh, art therapy programs. And, um, and we've been able, I, I hope this will work, I'll just kind of fast forward through this, um, to work with children and hospitals and refugee centers around the world creating these art spacesuits. Um, our spacesuit company, ILC Dover, who creates our real suits, uh, has, um, has volunteered to quilt these together for us. Uh, they uh, have, several of them have actually flown uh, to the space station. And we've been able to watch um, the kids experience this and then watch these suits fly through the space station. And I can tell you every astronaut who sees one of these colorful, gorgeous uh, art spacesuits wants to know why they have to keep wearing the white ones when they go out and do spacewalks. Um, we have a project in work right now uh, called Beyond where we are hopeful to get at least one child from every country uh, involved with, uh, with the art spacesuit. And we have um, the hope of crossing our fingers of not only flying that in, suit in space one day, but of, um, of taking that suit to uh, display and um, participate in the UN Climate Change Conference uh, in Glasgow in November, COP26. So very thankful to be included in that. And now I reflect back again, you know, this is another picture of Florida from space, uh, a little bit different perspective. It's, it's, there's no denying that Florida is part of a planet. 
um, a planet that's our home. And that's that's the way I think about home now. I think about our the fact that we're on this planet, our relationship to everything else around us that's interconnected, to um, exploration that we've done with robotic missions out to places like Saturn and this image where we're learning more about the rings and, uh, and everything about Saturn. And yet this little dot of light um, beneath those rings is us. And we always want to understand better our relationship um, to who and where we are in space. And I think there's no better image than this iconic Apollo 8 image known as Earthrise to show us to express to us who and where we are together on planet Earth. Um, and I can tell you through my experience in space, um, it's a complex thing to do these things in space. And yet I came home with three very simple lessons that are, we live on a planet, we are all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. So I'm very thankful to be here with you all today. Um, and I'm thankful that we are all uh, crewmates uh, here on Spaceship Earth. I'll try to stop sharing. Okay, did that work? Yes. <laughs> okay, Thank cool. Thank you so much for such uh, inspirational photos. And I love the Earthrise one. Um, yeah. The poet who spoke, Amanda Gorman, at the inauguration has a beautiful poem yes. on Earthrise that I implore all of you to look up. It's um, it, it's a stunning one. I had um, the the good fortune to speak with one of your colleagues recently, Kathy Sullivan, first of yes. all, to space. <laughs> um, and she, she shares your sentiment, as I'm sure so many astronauts who go to space do, looking down and seeing the interconnectedness. She also spoke about being able to see some human created physical borders and, and things like agriculture having transformed the land. I'm wondering if you've seen any of these kinds of signs and what that meant to you. Yeah, I think we do. You know, there's always this, um, this idea that you don't see borders from space, right? You know, we've heard that a lot before. I think what you don't see are the lines drawn on the maps, right? You know, we have this visual of this flat map with lines drawn all around things. We don't tend to see that, but we do see you know, how we have kind of played into the landscape, right? Um, you can see massively cleared areas uh, of, uh, of land. You can see the shifting of, you know, like the glacial activity, you know, Patagonia is one of these favorite spots to view and, and photograph. Um, you can see fires burning. I mean, those are the kinds of things that in one way or no, another, we know we are having a, a, an impact, a direct role in, um, and it's it's pretty um, it's pretty overwhelming to look at it that way because there's this contrast I think between looking at Earth from space as this beautiful, you know, undeniably, indescribably beautiful place, and yet knowing that you know there's another side of it, and you know I'm a rambler, but the the, the way I like to think of it is. Um, you know, we watch from space. We we have this this just amazing vantage point on on Earth, and it's like we're watching everything with the mute button on, right? You know, these 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 massive hurricanes, right? Swirling white, billowy hurricanes are moving across the planet. It looks gorgeous from space, absolutely gorgeous. And yet, as a girl who's grown up in Florida, I know that you get to the other side of that hurricane and it's not <laughs> it's not the gorgeous quiet billowy white you know hurricane that i see from the space station and so i think that's that's as humans we have to balance out that understanding we have of of things like that and know that um, that we can play a role in in turning it into that more beautiful view that we see, that more equitable view that we see from space, and make that a reality down here on the planet too. And whether the photos are taken from the International Space Station or from satellites, these photos that give us this view are so important to understand how the climate is changing and yeah. what we can be doing about it. That picture of you uh, out waving um, that made your your mom a little bit nervous. Um, it's so it's so beautiful and stunning, but I I can't help but wonder: Do you ever get a little bit scared? And and if so, what do you do for a sense of courage? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Kathy had some words about that. I you know it's it's interesting. Um, scared is not a word I would use. Um, 
respectful, diligent, um, deliberate, um, understanding of of the kind of the extremes of the environment that you're in. I think that's all something you are um, working with the whole time you're out there, right? You you know that this is this is a critical piece of hardware that's that's protecting you um, when you're out there. You know that that tether is important that you that my mom is was watching for every time I stop somewhere. She's like, she better put that thing on the, you know, on the station. But I, I don't think it's fear. I think it's I think it's respect for all of those different things, the risk and where you are and the work you're doing. And thankfully, we have such amazing training, you know, where a bulk of the training that we do is all about all that stuff we think can go wrong. So you feel like you're prepared, you know, to deal with it if something did, if that if that answers the question. But I'll yeah. tell you, I'll tell you, it's not like there's not fear in any of it. But it, I think for me, it was fear in a different way. The fear was not about the space station, about the spacewalk, about launch or landing to me. It was more of a personal fear with respect to my family, to how I knew they were feeling as they were watching me do all of this stuff. I mean, it's much more difficult to watch somebody you love strap onto a rocket or do a spacewalk than it is to be the one doing it. And this fear that something might happen to them. My son was seven when I flew the first time. You know, that something might happen to them on Earth and I wouldn't be able to be there. That That's where, if I think about the word fear, that's where I had it. <laughs> and I'm sure these extreme environments run the whole spectrum of human emotion and it's really what you make of it and and the lessons you learn from it. And I think that's absolutely incredible. We had a question on the particulars of the hardware and the spacesuit. Uh, Berkeley is wondering if you can hear through it. Well, you can't hear, I mean, if you're inside the station where there's you know, air and you've got a pressurized environment, um, if you're inside of the spacesuit, if somebody yells really loudly or if an alarm is going off inside of the space station, you could still hear that. Um, but once you leave the space station, once you go out into the vacuum of space inside of this protected, you know, um, space suit, you're not hearing anything from the outside of the suit. Um, but you hear like the pumps and the fans inside of the suit, kind of the hum of that. You hear, you know, of course, the calm through your headset um, with your crewmates and the people inside the station and that are down on Earth. You hear your own breathing and shuffling, you know, inside of the suit. But it's really this kind of comforting, um, comforting environment, both from a, a feel, you know, just like, oh, I'm snug in here to um, it's like you feel the support of those people through through the sounds that you get through your headset in the suit. Yeah. And and because we're. Um part of this educational outreach program that it's, it's uh, really trying to connect young students and, and focusing on women in the sciences. And of course, yesterday was the United Nations Day, yes. International Day of Girls in Science. Uh, I was looking over some of the statistics and one of the biggest gender gaps is in engineering. And it's still a big place where the United Nations is trying to amplify efforts to include younger people and yeah. feeling encouraged and, and comfortable to take this path. And I love that you use art as a tool yeah. to sort of break down some of those barriers. Can you talk a little bit more about that, just finding different ways to engage people? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, the art, you know, or like what we would think of kind of this creative side of things, I think it's just, it's like this universal communicator, right? It allows us to find a connection with each other to express ourselves in a way that we might not otherwise, you know, technically through the ones and zeros. And, um, and it, it helps us make a connection. Um, I think, you know, it's why I love participating in these, these events with you guys and, um, kind of, and the outreach that's being done is that we're able to establish a presence, right? We're able to be available to to young women and, and and young boys too to to see what's what's possible, and and I also love it because we can get at them young through, <laughs> you know, through these platforms, right? And I really believe that while I don't like to stereotype anything, I think young girls really do do need to see examples 
of, um, you know, of, of, of women that have done what they think might be impossible for them. And to find a belief in that. I mean, if I, if I think about the one thing that might have stopped me from getting to have the opportunities that I have, it would be myself doubting myself out of, of even making an attempt at them. And, uh, you know, and having this kind of visibility with other women and uh, being out there, I think it's our responsibility. And I'll just put a shout out for, uh, for the space program and space exploration activities. Um, at least what I know of it from the NASA side is um, hugely progressive when it comes to, um, you know, just the demographic of women and diversity in general. And I'll throw out two examples. Our NASA astronaut office is now roughly 40% women um, as compared to just 10 years ago where it was 20%. And both of those numbers exceed, just like you said, what, what people are finding at in engineering programs. We really need to keep doing these kinds of things to encourage women to, um, to get out there in the engineering workforce because the people that, that are hiring want you. Um, NASA wants you. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I, I'll mention one thing and then leave you with a final question, which is uh, the Explorers Club, which Nicole, we would love to have you come and be part of our next year of programming featuring, uh, featuring women explorers um, to the, your point about representation. So important to have these kinds of programs out there. Um, so I'm wondering when you do get downtime in these extreme environments to relax a little bit, what's your go to? What do you do? Do you listen to music? <laughs> Play cards? What's the what's the deal? Um, there's always music playing. I'll say that even through the workday, every module has some kind of music going on. If you if you can, you know, if you're not on the on the com loops and stuff. Um, that one picture I showed floating in front of that cupola window, I guarantee you, 99.9% .9 of the time, and if if a crew, if an astronaut has free time, that is where they are. They they are just absorbed in it. It is one of the most transcendent experiences I have ever had. Um, and you can listen to music in there. You can talk to your family from there. Um, that is the place to be. And I had the opportunity to paint a little bit too. People will do those kinds of things as well. Well, I'd love to see that that NASA astronaut playlist. Uh, maybe yeah. you can crop a video with Spotify at some point. Quite um, diverse. <laughs> Nicole, thank you so much for your yeah. time and for being with us. Such exciting work you do. I encourage everyone to check out the organization. And, um, more and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again in the future sometime soon. Yes, absolutely. Kate, thank you very much.